Okay, good evening. Um, I'm, I'm David Levine. I'm co-chair of SWANI, Science Writers in New York. I want to thank um, Joe Bonner, my co-chair, who's behind the scenes producing this. I'm here with Dr. Jennifer Rizzo. Not so. Yeah. That's a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Society Security, an associate professor at the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering and the Department of Epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's an epidemiologist by training. Her work focuses on global health security, a particular focus on outbreak detection and response, health systems as they relate to global health security, international, domestic biosurveillance and infectious disease diagnostics. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box, not the chat box, because that's just for um, Joe and um, Jennifer and I, and we'll take questions. Dr. Nutso, you want to, Nutso, you want to um, please share your screen and you have to show us what's going on in the world today? Sure, sure. Great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate um, the invitation to speak to this group and um, the opportunity to talk about COVID-19. I'm bringing some data from um, some tracking efforts that we have ongoing at Johns Hopkins, um, just to kind of maybe set the scene a little bit and just tell you where we are with respect to both the pandemic globally, but um, I'm gonna spend probably more time just focusing on the epidemic here in the United States. So um, this picture that I'm showing is a screenshot from a site that um, Johns Hopkins has run. Um, it's the COVID dashboard, um, which my colleague Lauren Gardner created. Um, it was really the first uh, resource of its kind and um, is one of the most um, heavily trafficked sites uh, related to COVID. Um, what she does is um, show in real time, essentially um, global case counts and then you know, broken down my country. Um, this uh, screenshot is from about midday today, about 2 p.m., and it represents um, the total number of cases being uh, reported worldwide as of that time. And unfortunately, as you can see, we are now over 16 million cases being reported by 188 countries worldwide. Um, you can see all the red dots there. I would not take from the map if there is not a red dot that it necessarily means the absence of cases. Um, I think there are a few points of light in this um, otherwise really uh, challenging and uh, difficult situation that the globe faces. But um, the fact that we have been able to stand up surveillance for a completely new virus in 188 countries is something that is a, an accomplishment in, in and of itself. Um, you know, number of these countries that are now reporting cases never had the ability to do the kind of testing that um, being able to find this virus requires. And the World Health Organization played a very important role in making uh, this happen. That said, um, not every country is um, finding cases uh, in the same way. And so um, you may see lots of dots on some countries and uh, not as many on others. And um, you know, there are some caveats to that. Um, I would call your attention to the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, which just shows you the daily cases and as you can see, um, we are now reporting more cases per day than we've ever reported in um, the history of this outbreak, hundreds of thousands of new cases uh, per day. And so that's um, obviously a very worrisome development. Uh, with respect to the United States, what I'm showing you now are um, the, the case numbers from about midday today. So we're over 4.2 million cases being reported within the US and over 140,000 deaths um, also reported. Again, I would call your attention to the bottom right-hand corner where you see the daily case um, curve. And I think the important thing here is that the number of cases being reported across the United States um, as of late is more than we have ever seen. So it eclipses by far the number of cases we saw in March when many states decided to close. Um, and this curve is quite different than what a number of other countries uh, are currently seeing. In many other countries, there was a very large spike, a peak, if you will, in the spring, 
followed by a sustained decline and now sort of a long tail of, um, you know, cases being accumulated over time, but not nearly what we're seeing in the United States where there's two humps and the second hump is larger than the first. Um, and the reason why we're in this situation, this sort of double humped, is that what we're now seeing right now is that the incidence, the occurrence of new cases is rising across the United States. As of today, about 26 states are seeing rising new daily case, case numbers. Um, and that's obviously uh, a trend that we don't like to see. We would much prefer states to either be stable or to have declining cases. Um, there's some small good news in this, which is that, um, you know, a number of the states that have been in the news as of late, like Arizona and Texas, um, they uh, were in a very, very worrisome situation a few weeks ago, but through various different efforts um, are now starting to see their case numbers come down, which um, is very much a, a welcome sign. And so they're reflected here in green, uh, which is good to see. You don't wanna be a red square in this, uh, in this visualization. Um, this is another uh, a data visualization that um, Hopkins has put together, and this is just showing um, the daily new cases population standardized um, to date. And um, in addition to the colors of the squares, you can see the squiggles in each square, which shows you sort of the curve um, in each state uh, over time. Uh, but clearly, Arizona, Texas, and Florida um, have been uh, very worrisome situations and looking at the size of their their peaks, uh, it is very worrisome indeed. However, um, good news that they are starting to, to see some declines and let's hope that those declines um, persist. Um, for a while there, uh, national leaders were trying to explain away the increasing case numbers as being an artifact of our surveillance. Um, arguing that the reason why we have so many cases in the United States is that we're doing much more testing um, than other countries and that, you know, if we weren't looking for cases, we wouldn't find them, which that part is definitely true. If we didn't test them, we wouldn't find infections as cases. Um, however, um, that's not really the point. Uh, the reason why um, we do testing is so that we can understand where infections are and so that we can take action to try to intervene. And with respect to testing in the United States, um, I'm showing in this graph here, this is another uh, visualization that um, Johns Hopkins produces. Um, in early April, uh, as you can see kind of by the pale yellow bars, testing was really constrained. It was very hard to get a test. So in New York, um, you know, in early April, um, you basically could only get a test if you were sick enough to be hospitalized. But over time, the number of tests that were capable of being, you know, that got performed in this country that the country is capable of performing um, has greatly increased to now, uh, you know, we're in the uh, pushing uh, over 700, 800,000 uh, tests per day. So that is quite a stark difference from uh, April and March where there were maybe fewer than 30,000 uh, tests being performed per day. That said, despite the fact that we are now doing more tests than we have ever done before, the virus, the spread of the virus has outpaced these efforts. And so um, the rise in cases that we are seeing is not just some kind of artifact of surveillance that we don't have to worry about. And the way that we know that is one of the things that we track is test positivity. And so that is the percentage of tests performed that are coming back positive. If the rise in cases was just purely an artifact of surveillance, we would see test positivity um, stay the same, possibly decline. But in the US, what we've been seeing as of late is test positivity is increasing. That means that the numerator, the number of positives is changing faster than the number of tests performed the denominator. So the spread of the virus has outpaced our efforts to expand testing. And so that tells us that more people are getting sick than ever got sick before. And it's not just because we're testing more that we're finding more cases. Um, that's the test positivity is represented by the blue line in this, this um, visualization. I will also say just to dispel some other myths that have been kind of offered by national leaders. Um, yes, the United States is performing on total more tests than many most other countries. Um, if you accept data offered from China as of late, um, we are not doing the total, the greatest number of tests. Um, but uh, compared to all other countries, the United States has done more tests total. 
Um, but we also have the largest epidemic in the world and therefore have had to do more tests. And so if you look at it even on a per capita basis, the United States is not doing the, the largest number of tests per capita, though per capita we are increasing. But what positivity tells us is that the amount of testing that we're doing, because we are um, still uh, increasing in our positivity as of late, and we have gone above a benchmark set by WHO of about 5%, that tells us that we still need to do more testing in order to find the infections that are out there, that we're still not casting a wide enough net to find infections and to count them as cases. So despite the efforts to expand testing in the US, we still have more work to do. And increasingly what we're seeing in the US is that um, unprecedented demand for testing, meaning we have to do more tests now than we've ever had to do before both because the virus is increasing and because companies and other places are looking to get testing done as a way to return to work. Um, because of that, uh, there are now delays, significant delays in um, getting test results back. And so um, if you get tested and you don't get your test results back in you know, a week or more, um, it's probably close to being pointless that you were tested in the first place. And so I think we're going to have a hard, hard conversation about testing in the coming uh, weeks to try to understand what level of testing we should be doing, given the supplies and the capacities that we have so that we can do testing in such a way that it can be informed action, meaning it's the, the first step in a process that should lead to interventions like isolating someone who is known to be infected, contact tracing, all of that depends on having test results come back in a timely enough fashion. And um, right now, we are not doing testing in a way to enable that. Um, this graph just shows kind of what I said before, just in terms of the United States compared to other countries. Um, this is an overall, the, um, the red line there, there is that 5% benchmark set by the WHO. And where the US is, um, and all countries, is based on um, their cumulative uh, positivity. So um, the US uh, had been doing well for a while, so we're closer to the 5% line, but in the future, we'll probably be a bit higher because our positivity has been creeping up. Um, but what you should take away from this list is that the countries that have, been, have done really well at responding to COVID-19 are all generally below the red line. And so that's places like New Zealand, uh, Australia, Iceland, um, Germany, even Greece, Thailand, Taiwan, uh, all below uh, the red line, meaning they've done enough testing uh, for their size of an epidemic. And um, because this also shows per capita testing, they have ranged in how many tests per capita they've had to do. But what they've all have in common is that they've kept their tests, they've done enough testing to keep their positivity low. So this is also from today. It's another visualization um, that my colleagues and I have um, put together at the Johns Hopkins COVID Testing Insights Initiative. And it just shows where states are um, over the last week with respect to positivity. And um, about a month ago when we were looking at this, we had about 11 states that were over the 5% line. And as of today, there are 34 states that are above the line, um, likely because uh, infections are increasing in those states. Um, increasing faster than they've been able to expand testing. So this is obviously signifies um, more work that needs to be done. So I'll just end with this last visualization, um, which is um, also something that we are looking at with respect to, you know, we started tracking testing um, in part because we had been tracking cases at Hopkins and it became increasingly clear that in order to interpret case numbers, we needed to understand the process by which cases are found and that's testing. So we wanted to understand uh, how much testing states were doing and how the United States compared to other countries. Um, but it's become increasingly clear that in order to understand testing and case numbers, we need to understand the larger policy environment in which this all occurs. And so um, when we start to see increases in a state, how does it relate to larger policies aimed at trying to slow uh, the spread of COVID-19? And so, um, what I'm showing here is just for one state, it, but we have it for, for, for all states. Um, just a visualization of uh, state level policy decisions on either openings or closings or pausings um, 
overlaid with uh, their uh, epidemic curves, their, their, their cases over time and new cases over time. Um, you can also toggle to see deaths if you want, but I just picked Arizona to give you an example of what we typically see in these graphs, which is um, when you see green horizontal lines, um, that means um, some kind of opening or, or loosening of a restriction. And it's fairly common that in states where you see some green lines and sometimes they're often sort of in close uh, succession, you know, um, you know, close distance to each other, uh, you know, clustered in, in time. Um, after we see uh, a bunch of green lines, then we start to see the case numbers go back up. And um, that may lead to um, a red line subsequently, which is what happened in Arizona, where the case numbers really started accelerating. And then they had to dial back on some of their, their openings um, in order to try to deal with uh, case numbers that were rapidly accelerating. And we see this in Texas and Florida and, and subsequent places. It's, it's, it seems to be not only, um, and we haven't done the full analysis, but just visually, it seems to be um, not just that there were openings, but there were multiple openings, um, not well spaced. So they didn't give enough time in between each decision to gauge whether a decision would have an impact, a negative impact on case numbers. Um, most public health experts recommended that when states think about reopening their economies, that they take a phased approach where they start first with the, the actions that we don't think are gonna contribute most heavily to disease spread, um, and, but then to wait and see after decisions are made so that we can um, gauge whether, uh, you know, a course correction is necessary if we have to kind of tighten or, or, or loosen a valve, um, if you will. And unfortunately, when you see a number of states kind of take a series of, of loosening efforts, um, we then do see a rise in cases. So the larger lesson here is that um, social distancing and shutdowns and restrictions are very much not a cure. They didn't make the virus go away. The majority of us are still susceptible to this virus. And if we open without any measure in its place, things like testing, contact tracing, and case isolation to try to keep the case numbers um, manageable, then we will see an acceleration of cases again. And now, unfortunately, a number of states are demonstrating that and are also having to go back to um, implementing restrictions in an effort to try to, once again, slow the spread of infection so that they can uh, further expand testing and improve contract tracing abilities and um, just get better at, at dealing with more case-based interventions rather than the broad shutdowns, which are more population-based interventions. So that's kind of my parting lesson. Um, this is what you should expect to see in the coming uh, weeks to months, uh, where some states are going to have to close valves again after they've opened it, um, which is unfortunate, but um, this is probably what we're in for um, for the time being until you know, we have some other tool and possibly a, a therapeutic or a vaccine, something else um, other than that. Right now, all we have are shutdowns or um, case-based interventions, which I believe are important, but um, we have not made enough progress on that front to fully avoid shutdowns, unfortunately. So I'm there and happy to take any questions. I, I see some chats some comments popping up on the chat, so. Um, so, um, all right, so I don't see any questions. No. Q&A box, please put some. Maybe if I stop sharing, maybe we can see it. Um, okay, I saw some chats pop up, but maybe not. Anyhow. Um, okay. Well, I do. I, I want to ask a question. Um, I see one. I see it. One here about testing. Well, okay, we'll talk, we'll talk a few minutes. Okay. So I went to Hopkins. Yeah. How did this project? How? Why did Hopkins become? Yeah. Um, so it really started with my colleague Lauren Gardner, who created the the map, um, the global map. And she is uh, in the School of Engineering, and um, she actually had a graduate student who had family in China and was here and was worried about his family. 
and wanted to kind of keep tabs on what was going on there. And I, I don't know if everybody remembers, but in the early days, it was sort of hard to get a sense of what was happening. And nobody was really tracking the total case numbers being reported. Um, and she suggested to him that they start basically a tracker, um, really with the goals of trying to stay informed, but also um, she's an infectious disease modeler and I think wanted to capture these data uh, to use it in modeling, to understand what actions uh, countries would, you know, what actions could be taken to slow the spread and what the evidence was, et cetera. So I think built it more as a tool for one thing, um, but it turned out to be a tool used for something else. And um, because there wasn't really anything else like it, um, and it was really the best place to go for up-to-date information about uh, COVID-19, it began being used by governments around the world um, including the U.S. government. There are many pictures in the uh, Health and Human Services Situation Room, um, their emergency operations center, where they have the Hopkins map kind of largely displayed on the big wall screen in, in the background. Um, and so it's really, um, you know, probably one of the most frequently tra trafficked sites. And once the university recognized the, the role that this project that one of our faculty, you know, very, um, you know, I have so much respect for her and what she uh, created. Um, and, you know, really the culture of Hopkins was such that we were in extraordinary circumstances and, you know, recognizing, I think, the role that we were playing and the resource that the site was, they invested um, themselves in trying to strengthen the site and make it uh, more durable and to expand it. And as a result, um, we have expanded what we what we do now. And um, so now we're tracking testing, we're tracking policies, we're also um, looking at, you know, contact tracing and, and many other things. And um, I have to say, it's been really heartening to, I mean, I've been working on pandemic preparedness for 20 years. Um, so, you know, I'm used to thinking about these issues and, and working on these issues. Um, but since this whole thing started, it's like, no stone has been unturned at Hopkins. Anybody who has some level of skills <laughs> or expertise um, has really come forward and tried to contribute, um, which I think, you know, the same could be said for larger society. Uh, I think that's just how people tend to react to crisis, but certainly in an academic setting, a number of people have come forward and proposed new additions to the site or trying to add analyses. Um, and it's been really, really helpful. So, um, it was probably a happy accident that then was um, followed by deliberate um, investment by the university to try to continue to contribute um, in in as much you know as much as we could. Okay, so we have some questions. Um, so this was written. What is the margin for COVID numbers statistics being reported? by Hopkins, are any of the death tolls overstated as people die of other causes? The hospitals report the cause as COVID. And what is the source of COVID statistics other than Hopkins? I'm sorry, so you're cutting out a little bit, David, but I think it, it's going about towards the kind of, what's the accuracy of the data? Um, so these are data that are reported from governments. Um, and um, it's a mix of uh, confirmed and probable cases. There is automated component, but there's also a vetting and there's been a vetting process um, ever since. And because we have so many eyeballs on the site, we continually get feedback from people as to, you know, um, if they don't think the data are right and we, we make adjustments as necessary. Um, but um, at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, our data is only as good as what governments are reporting. So if a government is systematically not reporting data, um, you know, we, we can't, you know, we don't have people on the ground to, 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 to get to the truth. Um, so, uh, you know, in an ideal world, I would say that we don't have to do this, that this would be a function of governments and international governmental organizations. Um, but it seems that, um, you know, uh, the in, in many places, the um, the informatics capabilities are limited and possibly not matched by, you know, say our partners at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory who, you know, have 
real data whizzes. So um, anyway, uh, it's a, it's a multi-step process. The data are publicly shared and there's a very long kind of explanation for this, the sourcing. Um, you know, I think the fact that it continues to be heavily relied upon um, is an indi indication of um, the perceived value and validity of the data. How large, is, how large is your team? Um, it's pretty small. I mean, Lauren and she has some few people, and then there's um, uh, the Applied Physics Laboratory. And gosh, I don't know what the total case count is, but it's it's small. Um, you know, maybe a few dozen people in a very small portion of their time um, working on it. Um, we actually have a lot of also kind of um, communication staff to try to make sure not that we're just like collecting data and analyzing, but that we're getting data out. Um, because, you know, the whole purpose of data is to inform action and we want to make sure people see what we know. Um, so there's some communication staff that work on it too. So here's a question from um, one thing we don't hear is who is getting tested and why are the majority getting tested symptomatic asymptomatic but exposed to COVID, or asymptomatic employees who are routinely tested who should be tested and how often should they be tested yeah so this is a really great question um, the answer is we don't know um, this is one of the problem with testing is that uh, individual states, for instance, can define, and the same thing applies to countries, but individual states can define who uh, they're going to allow to be tested um, and who they recommend to be tested. So um, you may have heard, it was last week or maybe the week before that, California um, after experiencing, like many other states, very long delays in um, getting test results back, essentially defined uh, a list of priority um, for who should be tested and or really more priority for, for processing of specimens. Um, and, uh, you know, um, that is uh, not something that, you know, in, in recent weeks, the emphasis on testing has been trying to cast as wide of a net as possible. Um, and, you know, many states were going in the opposite direction of trying to open, open, open who should get tested. Um, so for instance, where I live in Maryland, there were subsequent, you know, a series of, of decisions made like um, not requiring uh, doctor's prescriptions in order to get tested, um, not requiring that somebody be symptomatic. Um, Recently, around the July 4th weekend, they recommended that anybody who traveled out of state get tested. So really creating broad categories uh, uh, that, you know, almost apply to, to, you know, it applies to a lot of people. Um, and I think some people have a vision for testing that would be similarly broad. Um, that said, I don't. I very much worry that we are, um, in my mind, the most important thing is that we get the test results back in time to intervene. And if that means that we have to limit who gets tested in order to make that happen, then I would prefer to see that. Um, I also, um, although I understand the value of testing people without symptoms, um, testing people without symptoms and without any particular epidemiologic criteria, meaning they're not a contact of a case, they don't work in a high risk profession, they're just somebody who's wondering if they have it or not with no particular reason to wonder that. I'm not convinced that that's a good use of testing. Um, in, but some people do have that vision. So um, I would say stay tuned because I think um, where we are right now is gonna prompt uh, a larger conversation as to who should get tested and when and how much testing is enough and what value is it to get test results from a population that has no particular reason to be tested other than they just happen to show up? Um, and, and what, you know, if, if you get the kind of information you can act upon when you get test results in that population. So how good are the tests? Um, I had an antibody test when I went and it was negative, but is that accurate or we don't know? <laughs> So um, there are two general categories of tests. There's the viral tests, which are trying to tell you if you are infected. 
Um, and then there's the antibody tests that are trying to tell you if you may have been exposed in the past. Um, and um, I'll start with the viral tests because that's an easier one to, to that's what we track at the Hopkins site. We track the viral tests. And um, there's two approaches to viral testing. There's um, approaches that look for evidence of the genetic material of the virus. And then there are um, testing approaches that look for certain proteins on the surface of the virus. Um, the first one are tend to be PCR based, if you've heard of that. And then the second one are uh, antigen based. Um, the antigen based ones are newer. Um, for the most part, people say a positive is a positive, but a negative is not necessarily a negative. That said, and one of the reasons why I don't have a vision for testing that includes people with no symptoms and no particular epidemiologic criteria for testing is that no test is perfect. There is no such thing as 100% sensitivity and specificity in the wild. And when you apply a test to a low prevalence population, the positive predictive value of that test um, is lower than sometimes you'd like. So it can be hard to interpret a positive result sometimes. Um, and we are starting to see that. And we don't know fully if it's a false positive and what caused it. Sometimes it's not so much the test, but the, the user. Um, part of the problem is when companies demonstrate sensitivity and specificity of their tests in order to get um, FDA authorization, they do it you know, under very controlled circumstances, which may not translate to how they're actually performed um, you know, in the wild. So um, that's the challenge with, um, with the viral tests. But they're fairly good, I mean, compared to some other um, approaches and possibly compared to the antibody tests. And the antibody tests are the ones that are trying to tell you if you've been exposed in the past. And um, they have not undergone the same level of scrutiny as the viral tests because they are not supposed to be used to diagnose you with an active infection. And they can't really, because it takes some time for your body to produce the antibodies that could possibly register on these tests. So um, it, if, you did, if you did test positive while you're sort of actively infected, chances are it's a bit later in your, your course of illness. Um, because they haven't gone through the same regulatory scrutiny, there are questions about their performance that aren't fully clear yet. Um, however, there is an evaluation process ongoing by multiple governmental agencies. Um, similarly, just because you like how you actually enter, assuming you believe the test result, assuming that you think that the, the, the test was performed properly and it, you have valid results, interpreting those results is really quite, is difficult because just because you are positive doesn't mean you're immune. We don't know. We actually don't know. Um, so in my view, antibody testing, um, at least as sort of widely available are of limited utility. I think that that, that kind of testing is important in the context of well-designed seroprevalence studies, meaning we gave a lot of consideration to how we sample people with the goal of trying to understand the prevalence of prior exposure to the virus. But designing those studies takes um, effort. And one of the biggest challenges with the ones that have been done to date is when you get the results trying to understand how generalizable they are to the broader population. Um, it's another reason why we don't track antibody testing um, at the Hopkins site, because if somebody just takes it upon him or herself to go get tested, um, get an antibody test, I have absolutely no way of knowing if that person is, is generalizable in some way versus the people who decided not to be tested. So here's a question. Um, <clears throat> person is in Peru and she says, what is the margin of error in the sources of information for the global map? Some questions have been raised about world order and there are inconsistencies in some kind of information. I'm in Peru and I'm here. Okay, I don't know what the problem is. Okay. Yeah, so um, I think I sort of answered this question. I mean, it's it's the same sort of thing, which is the data are only as as good as what the governments report. And um, um, I think Worldometer is coming up because at one point that was listed as a source on our site, but it's not really a source on our site. Uh, we have this habit of sort of 
crediting anyone that we ever used, but things have changed over time and we have more of a, a vetting process now. So um, what can be tricky for us is sometimes governments change how they report data and sometimes it takes a little time to figure that out um, and then to figure out how we're gonna um, fit that into our site, recognizing that we're trying to track 188 countries that are reporting data um, and some choose to report probables, which are not necessarily laboratory confirmed and others don't. And so that creates some difficulties. That's one of the reasons why we're trying to better understand testing um, is because the process you take to, find, to go and find infections can change dramatically the number of cases that you report. Okay, so someone asked about Sweden. Um, I, we did an interview, you can find it on our YouTube channel on our, on our website. Um, I think that Sweden, actually Sweden is following a different approach. And what is your understanding of this issue? And why, government forced, why are government forced shutdowns necessary or the right thing to do? Yeah, so um, I think what people talk about with Sweden is that they have not um, done the same level of shutdown that other governments have decided to do. And um, I had... I didn't show it, but I often show a graph comparing Sweden to Finland um, because um, they're fairly similar countries and their epidemics started around the same time, but the governments took very different approaches. And um, the kind of short, the summary of that graph of the chart that I show is that the total number of infections and the infections per capita in Sweden is dramatically higher than Finland as are the case fatality, as is the case fatality um, ratio. So basically on our, on, you know, even when we adjust for population, Sweden has seen more cases and more deaths than neighboring Finland, which um, has taken more of a centralized approach to trying to, to slow the spread. That said, um, I think everybody was surprised when they did um, some of their uh, serology studies in Sweden that um, they didn't see a higher level of, of um, prior exposure to the virus, meaning that the vast majority of the population in Sweden remains vulnerable to the virus. So it didn't just sweep right through and achieve herd immunity, um, even though that wasn't the explicit goal of the government, um, but it does, I think, paint for them a very long road ahead and they've already amassed, um, you know, really, uh, you know, much more um, harms um, compared to some of their, their neighbors. Um, and um, the idea of a shutdown, I think part of, um, part of why one might want to avoid it, and I have other reasons, but I'll just tell you like on the face value of shutdowns is that, well, it hurts the economy. Um, and I don't think that there's been a compelling argument that Sweden has fared economically better than it's other, than other countries, um, despite taking a different approach. That said, so there's the question about why are government shutdowns, you know, the right thing to do and necessary. Um, my beliefs on this topic is that shutdowns are something that we should avoid unless they're necessary. They are very blunt tools. They are not specific. They are like swinging a sledgehammer. And although they can be effective at slowing the spread of the virus, kind of they're a pause button, they're not a cure. And as soon as you hit play, unless you have something else in its place, the case numbers are gonna come right back up. So um, I am much more interested in countries pursuing targeted case-based interventions. And that is testing to figure out everyone who's infected, um, isolating anyone we know to be infected, uh, figuring out who they may have exposed prior to um, to becoming known as a case, and that's a process called contact tracing. Find all those people, let them know that they've been exposed to a case and that they too should stay home until we know for sure that they're not contagious. Those testing, tracing, isolation methods have been used by many countries um, successfully to keep their case numbers at bay. Um, and in some cases have allowed them to avoid a level of shutdown that other countries have had to do. That said, if you have, don't have enough capacity to do those case-based interventions or your case numbers are too high, like we're seeing in a lot of the United States right now, it's really hard to do them because they're resource intensive. And so that's where you get into a situation where 
shutdowns become unavoidable. And, you know, you could either leave it open and hope nobody goes, or you could say, we just can't tolerate it and we, we can't have it. And I think one of the better news of what's coming out of Arizona um, is that, uh, you know, they did pause their reopening. In fact, they went back and, you know, closed bars, for instance, and it seems to be having an effect as um, they've also, you know, added, um, you know, a stronger emphasis on, on masks, um, mask use. Their curve seems to be flattening as of late. And, you know, I'm hopeful that that's a sign that um, even if we do have to return to some shutdowns, which I very much would like to see states have to avoid because of the harms that they produce, um, that perhaps maybe only targeted shutdowns are necessary, things that are aimed at the highest risk at the, the venues that are highest risk for transmission, possibly things like, you know, bars, which are particularly good places to spread the virus. Okay, so you've been a little famous on Twitter for your stand on opening schools. And um, I was very- I don't know if it's famous or infamous, but yeah. I'm very surprised that some of the responses to uh, text you on Twitter. So you, you are in favor of opening schools. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't paint that broad of a stroke. I, I think it is possible to reopen schools safely, but there's giant butts there. Um, first of all, the first, the first thing we need to do is get our epidemic under control. And I think if you're in a place like Texas or Florida or Arizona, where the case numbers, you know, for many weeks were accelerating, it's going to be hard to open schools because chances are you're going to have cases in the schools, and they're probably going to have to shut down at least for some time. And I. You know, that's obviously not a desirable situation. Um, but if you're in a place where the case numbers are stable or hopefully declining, I think it's possible to open schools safely. And, you know, schools, I think, represent lower risk environments than many other places we allowed to be open and we continue to frequent. Um, and if you add to the kind of lower risk environment um, certain safety precautions, um, I think it is possible to further reduce um, risk in the in 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 school settings. Um, other countries have been able to open schools successfully, and they don't see um, you know a huge uptick in cases. However, um, many of these countries are not in the same place that we are right now in the U.S. I would like to see us get there, and I think it's possible for us to get there. And one of the arguments that I've made is schools are a pri should be a priority for us. I view them like critical infrastructure. I mean, we, there were certain essential businesses that we kept open because we knew we couldn't live without them. And in my view, schools are play that kind of important role in our communities. And so if we are going to prioritize op keeping anything open, um, I would rather see us close other things that have less direct benefits to our broader society so that we can keep schools open. Um. So here's a question. Are you preparing to track data on vaccinations and resulting changes? In I'm sorry, what? So, is this, when there is a vaccination, are you going oh. to that? Yeah, we're talking about that. We're not sure. It'll depend on what data are available. We rely on publicly available data at this point. Um, so we'll see what gets tracked. Um, but yes, we are gearing up to think about um, vaccinations and, and other um, other tools like med you know therapeutics. Um, but we we no specific plans yet. So the head of the CDC said that everybody, if everybody wore masks for four weeks, the virus would go away. Basically, he said, that's what he said. Is that true, or is there partial true, or is that wishful thinking? this virus isn't going to go away. I mean, uh, people may not remember, we had a flu pandemic in 2009, uh, H1N1. It was for a short time called swine flu. That virus is with us every flu season. It's part of our seasonal flu mix. I don't expect this virus is going to go away. Do I think we could get our epidemic under control uh, through mask use? Possibly. I think they're probably an important tool. I was probably a little bit more skeptical about them in the beginning than I am now. Um, are they going to be sufficient? I don't think we have the data to say that mask use alone is going to do it. But mask use combined with all the other things that we've seen other countries do, I think we have good data from other countries that it is possible to bring 
your case numbers down to low level, low manageable levels um, and keep them that way until uh, we get a vaccine. So I have a question because I have friends in Texas who were telling me in March, and April, and May said, we're, we're not doing anything differently, but we're not getting it. So what caused the sudden spikes in Texas? Well, it takes time. It takes time for cases to become apparent. And also it's a function of who gets test, who gets it and who gets tested. So if you're a 20 year old and you get the virus, you first of all may never develop symptoms, but could potentially still transmit it. Or you may get mild symptoms you don't really notice, doesn't really set you back. And you go out and you infect other people, same thing happens, they, you know, to barely notice what happens. And this goes on for some time until it gets to somebody who gets sick enough to either get tested or sick enough to show up at a hospital. Um, and, you know, initially when we started seeing the cases in the younger population, I think people saw that as a sign that um, of, of success in some way saying, well, it's the younger folks and they don't tend to get hospitalized and die which is true statistically, they are less likely to be hospitalized and die from the virus, but it doesn't mean it stays in that population. And it takes time to find more vulnerable groups. Um, one of the things that we're learning here locally where I live is that um, not only are the cases younger than they've been um, you know, in prior months, but when they find each case, because they do fairly aggressive contact tracing here where I live, um, they're finding that each case has many more contacts than previous cases used to. So in the spring, when they found a case, it was, the, it was rare for a case to have 10 contacts. But now these younger cases that they're finding, these 20 something year olds, um, they're finding routinely that they have 10 to 20 contacts that they then have to go out and do contact tracing on. So, you can imagine if you're, you know, if those initial cases were these 20 year olds with uh, 20 contacts, some of the, you know, the, the infections will keep accumulating until it gets to somebody who is sick enough to get tested and sick enough or sick enough to show up at a hospital. And unfortunately, you know, the vulnerable populations among us can't fully isolate themselves and inevitably it shows up um, in those groups. And I, I also don't wanna leave the impression that age is completely protective because there are people who become perfectly healthy people who are young, who become sick and die, um, but also underlying health conditions exist even in younger ages. So it takes time and, and that's just what, what happens. Um, we really see a lag. Uh, it takes a while for epidemics to become uh, visible. And then similarly, um, you know, initially, I think people were sort of celebrating that the death numbers weren't what they were um, in the spring. Um, now, just like a, a general premise is that when you start looking for, you know, when, when you first discover a novel virus in your midst, you tend to overfind deaths initially because those are the first cases you can find. And then as you expand your surveillance, you find more of the, the mild infections. So um, we would expect uh, over-representation of deaths among cases in the beginning than we would now. That said, um, just as many people predicted, um, the death numbers are starting to increase in even those states where they were initially low. And that's because if you, if you are sick enough today to be tested, I mean, first of all, you have to get infected and then you're probably home for some time until you start noticing that you're not feeling well. And then you show up and get tested and you find that you're positive. You may go back home and stay at home for another week until you really don't feel well. And then you may go to the hospital and you may be there for some time before you get admitted to an ICU. And then you could be in the ICU for weeks before you die. So deaths are a very lagging indicator. And we're now unfortunately starting to see those deaths show up. So we're science writers in New York. So we have a Governor Cuomo. Mm -hmm. um, so he went on TV every day for months um, I was just wondering what you thought of that approach that he did and also um, the way he's handled the shutdowns. I think he's been one of the more effective leaders on this issue. Um, I think the daily uh, updates are really important. I think he made some really hard choices, um, which took a lot of bravery, I think, because uh, New York had the unfortunate situation of being one of the first to go through this at a time when we knew very little um, and so being able to make decisions 
particularly high consequence ones, such as the level of shutdown that New York underwent. Um, and that's not easy to do. And, um, you know, I, I think there are a number of things that people want to find fault in, and I, I'm not sure it's really deserved because, um, you know, New York had the unfortunate uh, luck of being first in many ways, and now is one of the safest places in the country. Now it will remain vulnerable because of that. And, you know, I think he has also rightly said, we are not out of the woods, you know, as long as the epidemic is raging in the rest of the country, we remain vulnerable because people are going to come here and they want to, they want to escape. Um, you know, they want a summer free of worry. So they'll come to New York because New York is, um, you know, has some of the lowest case numbers. Um, so it's not going to, you know, you success is not permanent. It requires continued vigilance and continued effort. Um, but I think for all intents and purposes, he's done a fairly good job. So there's been a lot of arguments back and forth about the cruelty of being shut down, the mental health aspects of it. Yeah. I mean, my daughter is with a four month old, a two and a half year old and her husband. And I made the naive comment saying, gee, it must be nice to be bonding. And she said, no, she said, no. I, said, I, want my, I want my husband at work, I want my yeah. preschool, I want my babysitter back, you know, and she, she just was laughing at me. So I, that was my, you know, being a little naive. Um, but um, I think there are, you know, it's, I mean, I'm alone, it's, it is tough to be shut down, but other people say, I would trade places with you in two seconds. Or less. Because you know I'm screaming kids, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, here's a question. So mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you think about the way nursing homes have been shut down to outside visitors? Because that's a tough for them, for the family. Yeah, um, it's really tough. I mean, nursing homes are the, the thing that I worry the most about. Um, they are so incredibly vulnerable to outbreaks and unfortunately very vulnerable to deadly outbreaks. So um, it, and particularly in the spring, I mean, it just it's hard to remember where we were, but we were in a situation where we could barely test for the virus and there was no PPE. So these nursing homes who have these incredibly vulnerable residents, they have staff that rotate between facilities who live in the community in which the virus is raging. It's incredibly hard to try to keep the virus out of these four walls and, um, and then when you add to it sort of the non-essential visits, I mean, non-essential, obviously there are benefits, but um, it's not the same as having staff coming and going. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think it was really necessary. Now, is it still necessary? I still worry about nursing homes. I, you know, once the virus gets into these facilities, it can spread like wildfire. And, you know, there are some estimates that um, possibly as much as, you know, uh, a quarter to even close to half of US deaths from this virus have been linked to nursing homes. So the stakes are enormously high. Now, I really, my mom used to be in a nursing home. I, you know, that end of life and um, the, 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 the joys are few and to think of denying people access to their loved ones absolutely breaks my heart. But unfortunately, um, particularly absent really high quality, you know, absent access to personal protective equipment and, and testing. I think it's really hard to imagine people coming and going from these facilities. I hope we can make better use of those tools to maybe allow some of it, but the stakes are just so high if the virus comes in. And as long as the epidemic is raging and the outside of the community, it's gonna find its way in unless we can figure out how to detect it as soon as it comes in. Well, I know in New York, now um, you can visit someone in a nursing home if you're sitting outside with them and only two people at a time. Yeah, I think those approaches are, are, are good ones. Um, I think now that we better understand how much harder indoor environments are for transmission, uh, you know, how, how much more it facilitates transmission than sitting outside. I don't think we had a really great sense of that in the spring, but I think now that, that makes a lot more sense. So the National Gallery opened up this weekend. Smithsonian is opening up, but Governor Cuomo says, no, Metropolitan Museum can't open up. Yeah. What's your feeling about museums? Um, I don't go, I mean. Okay. I, <laughs> I want schools to open up. I, I, 
I've got two young kids. Uh, we, we limit, you know, we only go where we need to go and really it's almost nowhere. Um, so as much as I love those places and I mean, my, my dream is <laughs> when this all lifts or so going back to the symphony, I <laughs> like really, really miss those places. Um, I don't need to be in indoor crowded spaces with high touch, touch places. Um, no one is saying this is the best summer ever. Okay. This is a terrible summer. This is, this is, it's hard to beat in terms of that. Um, I have to ask a question. Yeah. Relative. Do I need to sanitize cans, bottles, and any kind of packaging that comes from grocery stores? How do I treat fresh fruit and vegetables, broccoli, lettuce, et cetera? I don't do that. Um, I think we know more about, uh, you know, um, to me, I think we increasingly know that, that surfaces, I mean, sure, if somebody just touched it and then you touch it and then you touch your eyes, mouth or nose, then perhaps, but um, uh, I don't really, I mean, I, I will tell you, I wash some of my produce because I'm concerned about things like listeria and salmonella. <laughs> Um, but I don't routinely do that um, for my groceries. So here's a question, um, which you kind of talked about. Um, what are your thoughts on the proposal from some scientists that the U.S. invests in the rapid but less accurate tests? Could daily but less accurate tests provide meaningful data to alter the course of the pandemic? I think we need to figure it out and figure out how that would help. I'm not opposed to it. I, I think perhaps a two-step approach m might not be a bad one, but we also need to examine what, um, how we would roll that out and um, what the steps would be and whether it would um, lead to results that we can trust in a timely enough manner to take action. I mean, for, for me, it's imp most important that we are able to take action. And if we do testing and and it comes back so late that we can't actually act, then I think that it's it's pointless. Um, but I think there are some merits in, in that. That said, I have seen the consequences of testing being done in low prevalence populations. I've advised a number of different sectors who have been using testing. And let me tell you, it becomes much more operationally tricky to use testing um, to establish safety than you would think. And sometimes it produces results that you don't know how to interpret, which can lead to unnecessary delays. And so I really think we have to fully evaluate it. Um, I'm not, I'm not um, dismissing of these approaches. I just think that we need to fully think through the steps and to make sure that it's going to lead us down a path towards enhanced intervention. So countries like France and Italy and Spain, um, Sweden, they have, they don't let it up to each region. They have a national policy. And do you think if we had, if we had a national policy under someone like Cuomo, would that have made our numbers better? If we had like fa you know, phases and you know, initial lockdowns and phases and everyone wearing masks, would that have made it better if we were a national, you know, if we were not the federals? You know, not, not leaving it up to governors. Yeah, so I think there are some areas for which we need national, we have, we have needed and continue to need national leadership. And for me, testing is a big one. I think um, the bottlenecks that we have had in testing and in many, we had them in the spring and we have them now. We just kind of put together these stopgap measures in between to try to, you know, uh, patch it over a bit, but they, we didn't develop sustainable fixes to our problems. Um, and, you know, when you have something where you have 50 different states struggling to get the access to the supplies that they need, in many cases, or in some cases, that requires them to, say, negotiate with foreign governments and try to import uh, materials that may not be, um, you know, allowed by the FDA, but for which then what they have to go and try to get approval to use. I mean, it's, it's really, I don't think states are well positioned to solve what is essentially a global problem. And having a national strategy for testing, I think would have been enormously, um, is, we still need it, <laughs> is absolutely necessary and, and, uh, and, and, and very much needed. I, I don't think we can continue on this path where we're basically like the Hunger Games and we're making, you know, 
50 different states compete against each other for, for the resources they need uh, in order to, to manage the situation. Because, you know, again, you know, looking at the context of New York, New York's doing well, but it still remains vulnerable given the fact that other states are not doing well. So we need national approaches that can put us towards a path of greater progress. Um, I think testing is one area in particular. I think another thing that we um, have not seen enough of, which is um, a voice of authority. So it is deeply troubling to me that the CDC has not been doing daily briefings and trying to weigh in on very high consequence technical issues for which we need the world-class scientists of the CDC to truly weigh in on and to be able to weigh in on in a way that's not filtered through politics. Um, that has been really troubling. And there are lots of confusion about, you know, transmission and in what environments and how much people who don't have symptoms transmit. And, you know, that absent that level of um, singular clarity and singular, you know, kind of technical authority, uh, we're kind of grasping, you know, swinging at all sorts of windmills and we can't really afford to do that in a pandemic. So that's another thing. And then finally, National leaders should be modeling good behavior. So, you know, not questioning the existence of the virus, not pretending that the virus is going away mythically at various points, not, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, wearing masks if necessary, not, um, you know, visually being seen doing things that we're asking the rest of the country not to do. I don't think we have valued enough risk communication as an important tool. And um, leaders play an enormous role in, in performing risk communication. Um, it's one thing for health experts to say something, but if, that, if what they say then gets undermined by the elected officials above them, it, it, it really can dilute the impact. So um, I think having a national you know, leadership that, that establishes priorities for the country and commits us to it and acknowledges the, the challenges that we're going through and um, gives us confidence that we will get through it and, and a plan to, that follows, I think is, it has been missing and, and would be really important. I mean, it's just what we've seen other countries use to their success. And now they are enjoying lower case numbers and they're reopening their economy and they're doing great by comparison. So what, are you optimistic about the future, pessimistic about the future? Um, I mean, when everyone talks about vaccines, I say, well, why, it'd be nice if we found just medications that work better. Yeah. What do you, I'm, like, I'm optimistic on both of those fronts. It's just a question of how long it's gonna take. And, you know, um, I don't think it'll be here by the fall. And I'm really worried about the fall. I, you know, putting this virus on top of flu, I'm hoping the flu, um, you know, uh, we don't know what the flu season is going to entail, um, but I think we should prepare for it to be bad. Let's hope it isn't just because we are staying home more than we would usually, but um, I'm, I am worried about um, the fall. And unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see medicines or vaccines by then. When should people be getting flu shots? Because so, yeah, I mean, so if you follow the issue, there's a there's concern about potential, like if you get it too early, maybe your immunity will wane through the season. The challenge with that is that we never fully know when the virus is gonna show up and you wanna get it before you get exposed to the virus. So I typically get it in September, early October. Um, but if like you have the opportunity to get it sooner and that's the time that you're gonna get it versus waiting later, you may not get it, then I would, I would rather you get it earlier than not get it, you know, to possibly have things come up that prevent you from getting it before you get exposed. So when there is a vaccine offered, do you think people are going to be lining up for it? Or are there going to be people are going to be afraid to get it? I think that depends. It'll depend on the communication and it will depend on the data. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'll probably have people in both camps. Okay. And I'll ask you one last question. What do you th think about pooled testing? Yeah, so I'm assuming the US is gonna start using this approach. Um, okay, what is pooled testing? So the idea with pooled testing is that um, instead of testing each individual specimen, you batch your specimens and you test the batch. And if the batch comes back positive, then you go back and test everyone who was in that batch. Um, 
to figure out who was the positive. Uh, it works best when uh, prevalence is low um, because if prevalence is high, then <laughs> you're essentially testing close to every specimen. Um, the benefits are if prevalence is low, then potentially you can get test results without having to use as many reagents and other things. Um, some people say it might be faster. Um, two concerns I have. One is that um, we need to make sure, you know, is our prevalence low enough? And um, at the rate case numbers have been increasing, we may be moving past that point. Um, but the next step is, um, will the pooled testing meaningfully expedite time to results? And if it's a multi-step multi process, um, you know, that adds a level of complexity to what's already a complex situation. And so um, will we get results faster? And I, um, I've talked to laboratory laboratorians on this topic and there's still some question marks around that. So um, it may help, but we don't fully know. Okay, so I want to, any final words you want to say? Um, so I will just say, I mean, this is a dreary topic, I have to say. I mean, this has been dreary. We're all ready to be done with this thing. Um, it has been hard on all of us in ways that I think even those of us who have worked in this field for 20 years didn't fully appreciate. Um, you know, I, I do see some points of light and I, I just want to share them because otherwise it's, I think we could just, you know, feel like there's no hope and no real path forward. Um, the one thing is for me, generally speaking, I think above all this pandemic illustrates why our health is one of the most important things we have. And when our health is in question, basically everything else stops. And so I, I try to take that as permission and, and encourage people to take that as permission to um, give yourself time to work on your health um, to the extent that you can. Um, but also, I, I, you know, as much as I really lament the absence of federal leadership, I have been really, really impressed by the kind of bottom up approaches that I've seen where companies are really just kind of pitch in and figure out how they can help and individuals are pitching in and how they can help. And, um, you know, governors are taking actions that frankly, we should never even have asked them to do, but nonetheless, they are, they are doing it. So I do think that there is a groundswell of people who are uh, leaning in and trying to fix this problem. And for me, when I see humanity kind of respond in that way, I find that like enormously inspiring. So um, we hear bad stories, of course, of you know people making the wrong choices, um, but I think overwhelmingly people are just trying to figure out how best to live and protect themselves and their families. And um, I think it just kind of reminds me of how all connected we are and how, um, you know, how we, we live in a community that can pull together when um, presented with stress. Okay, well, I wanna thank you for your spending some time with us and um, this will be on YouTube so people can watch it um, again and again. And I also encourage you to go to the Hopkins Center and where do they, where do they find the data? Yeah, so coronavirus.jhu.edu, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. It's not just the map, although the map is um, what, what you'll see when you get there. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other data and just click around. And um, I'm always finding new things that I did, forgot we had. So um, there's a lot of information there. And I think in this day and age where some of this stuff becomes politicized, I think finding a, a neutral source that, you know, a neutral, credible source, I think is important for making decisions about how to protect yourself and your family. So that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so on August 3rd, I'm gonna be interviewing Roxanne Kazmi, who was the former editor of Nature, and who's now a freelancer, and she did the first story in COVID-19 in February. So she was ahead of her time. Um, so I hope we'll keep tuning into our chats. And again, thank you so much for being with us and sharing this information and also having a chart so I don't have to try and understand it, explain it. And um, stay safe, and uh, my regards to my alma mater and uh, Baltimore. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Stay healthy, everybody. Thank you.